Ruben Oris Valiente, Vice President of Nuclear Steam Engineering here at SNC Lavalin. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So I was very intrigued by the bullets that you sent me because it said that you went to university in Moscow. Well, that's a, that's a, a real story. Um, I kind of, um, I was born in Cuba. So at that time they belonged to the Soviet bloc and um, I got a scholarship and um, I ended up in Moscow um, mm -hmm. learning nuclear engineering. So that's how I ended up there. And then I got to live there 10 years. Cool. And so what motivated you to study nuclear engineering? Did you know that before going to Moscow? Well, not precisely. At, at the beginning, I wanted to be, as all the kids, an astronaut. <laughs> but um, those uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, wishes kind of uh, evolved into other areas. And at some point in time, I, I thought to become a doctor, but I then changed. I, I kind of uh, was influenced by my father. He was an electrical engineer, and uh, he was shaping me um, unknowingly or unbeknownst known to me, yeah. uh, he was shaping me towards <laughs> wherever he wanted me to be. And then, then I, I kind of read some kind of a books about uh, nuclear physics. And uh, after that, I decided that this is going to be my major. So, and I applied for it. I got the scholarship and that's how life went on. Yeah, amazing. And you were at university studying nuclear engineering when Chernobyl incident occurred. It was my third year. I do clearly remember uh, people coming, asking for volunteers to go there and do the cleanup. And then because we were young, because we were restless and we, majority of us volunteered. Did you? Uh, yes. Uh, however, after 24 hours of our volunteering, we got a communication through our embassy uh -huh. that the accident was uh, worse than what we had in mind. So it was a kind of a, um, unadvisable to even entertain that type of assignment. And then that was corroborated by some of the teachers that got the opportunity to learn what was going on, so they sat us, uh, sat, sat us and told us what have uh, stemmed out of this accident, and then we kind of uh, cooled down and we kind of uh, politely passed on that opportunity. Yeah. So, but yeah, we were there at the time. And so how did that change your views on nuclear? <clears throat> well, it didn't change the view um, as per se, because we knew it was a needed it is a needed industry, much needed. It's just uh, changed my view in a sense that there has to be something else more than engineering in order to kind of emerge, make the industry more palatable. Mm -hmm. So after that, the safety culture became more uh, prevalent in the industry and the, we had to make some adjustments. And at the same time, after this accident, the industry um, started to kind of uh, debilitate itself. The, the interest on the industry was waning. Um, when I kind of uh, graduated, I was supposed to go and finish building two nuclear reactors in Cuba and operate them and live happily ever after there. <laughs> but um, the reality hit us when we got there. The project was kind of a not doing so great mm -hmm. and they after a year or so it was uh, cancelled so we have to move on and go to other industries um, in the hope that we would somehow return to this project and finish what we were uh, kind of uh, promised yeah at some point in time but um, that didn't happen and uh, i kind of started working for a utility uh, very big um, for the country I was living in. And uh, I spent then five years and I developed myself from kind of a junior operator to the general chief manager. And um, I just was waiting for 
the nuclear project to be revived and go back to, to it, but it never happened. Then I went back to Russia at the time. I worked there in the petrochemical industry and the, um, for two or three years, everything was fine. And then I decided that I needed to see more horizons and I just immigrated to Canada. So yeah, here we are. It's amazing because I think most people I, if they were studying nuclear engineering at the time, might have kind of been uncertain about going into that industry, but you just ran right into it and you were hopeful the whole time that it That's was correct. going to come back. That's correct. But now is the resurgence of nuclear. Yeah, That's especially correct. here in Canada. And so it's a completely different environment for well, you. That's correct. We've had at this point in time two renaissance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one occurred around 2010, when the, the whole world was very kind of a keen in uh, doing something with the industry and the projects were kind of a being kind of a worked on. And then the, the accident in Fukushima happened. So after that, everything started cooling down again until the, the, the kind of a topic of SMR be kind of a transform the industry into something that became cool again. Yeah. So after that, I have a lot of a renov a renovated interest on the young engineers, the people from the outside the industry asking me questions about it. And it's, it's kind of a something that's a stealing the attraction from the from the people. It's stealing the, the, the they're the, the kind of a, their focus and it's good for us because it, it tells uh, volumes about the capability of the people that work and operate this industry. So in that regard, um, I feel comfortable with this renaissance. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and now you're, you know, a person that can really train those young people and teach them about the mistakes in the past and how to push the industry forward. So you're in a really great position during this renaissance because you're in a powerful position. Well, I, <laughs> I kind of, uh, I, I don't see that way. I just, I just wanted to contribute. And uh, uh, because uh, when I came to, to North America, I just uh, found immediately that there was a generational gap in the nuclear engineer engineering roles. Mm. I mean, uh, there is a kind of a time uh, where the educational system stopped churning out engineers. And the, you can see um, everywhere there is a gap between people my age and the youngsters that are kind of a 10, 15 years apart. So, and we are at this point in time also kind of a um, having to deal with the look ahead, we have to prepare for when we retire and those young people kind of uh, come into our footsteps. Um, and that is, uh, that, that is something that keeps me awake at night because I have to pass the torch. I have to design something that is interesting to the people that are coming behind us. And uh, I have to have the, f the tools to do that. I have to have the support to do that. And I have to find the people that are passionate enough to, to deliver those, uh, those training and pass the knowledge. Uh, that is a kind of, a, uh, that is what uh, I'm passionate about. Yeah, and so where are you in that, in that whole <clears throat> process? Well, it's a kind of, um, I'm having some mixed successes. <laughs> I have my challenges. Um, well, uh, one of the things that we are doing is to kind of uh, engage in the retirees and trying to have them to come into our premises and for one or twice a, a month just deliver something of what they have learned, of what they think is good to, to, to transmit to the, the other generations. Uh, and this is just part of the the equation because this is something that happens very intermittently and uh, we would like to um, keep the, the 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 people that we are training for for the for the future more engaged in a constant manner so uh, we are devising some kind of a training plans in house we are uh, putting some money to support those training plans uh, we have a robust product development uh, budget in place to 
kind of uh, maintain the capability of those people to um, kind of uh, concoct projects that keep their, their imagination alive. So, um, so this is uh, one of the things. And the other one is just to uh, trying to engage the, institu the institutions that produce those engineers mm -hmm. to produce them in the way that we we, we feel that they will be kind of a more useful when they get out of uh, those institutions. So this is one of the, the challenges that I have to work on. Um, even though in Canada right now, we have many more universities than before uh, with a nuclear engineering kind of a courses, mm -hmm. so which is a plus, but still is not enough to do this uh, kind of a generational turnover in a successful manner. Yeah. Do most of the universities in Canada have nuclear programs to begin with? No. So no. how do we address that? So uh, we address that by advertising the opportunities that those young people will have once they graduate. Yeah. Uh, right now, I know of four or five universities that carry the nuclear engineering program and the Perhaps it's not enough with all this renaissance that is going on for the SMRs, for the refurbishments that are going on around the, the world in, in this country, um, and the new bills that we will most probably experience in the next, I don't know, five, ten years. So for those, we have to be ready. Yeah. And the, there will not be a kind of a pool of people if we do not communicate those a kind of opportunities to to the public. You have to kind of capture the, the imagination of the people early enough so they have time to kind of embrace it and, and run with it. So right. that's, that's, that's my, my, my challenge. Yeah, and I, I think that because Canada is, you know, you, you're such a big user of nuclear energy, more people would be engaged and would be aware, but I think but the hard part is that nuclear plays a big role in people's lives, but it's hidden. That's correct. Yeah, and so, you know, companies like SNC-Lavalin have to bring it to the forefront and really That's show correct. off what you guys do. Yes, I, I, I believe that, I believe if that uh, a regular person sits and kind of internalize the fact that Toronto is surrounded by 12 or it's about 12 operating reactors in kind of an average. The people would be surprised. Yeah. Because there's a lot of reactors and no one imagined being very close to the city. Yeah. And this is what powers Toronto. This is what powers Ontario. So, uh, and we have to make a better kind of a campaign, public campaign, making people aware that this is the, the, the thing that maintains everything here lit mm -hmm. and warm and kind of a AC. And so this is our kind of a livestock. Yeah. And I think an important part, a, a way to promote it is to talk about what's happening five or 10 years down the line. And I mean, even later with some of the new technologies that are coming out and especially the new successes in refurbishing the can-do technologies. So if you want to talk about the new and emerging technologies you guys are working on. Well, um, we have a first a, a, a reactor design that we have uh, improved and make it um, compliant with the modern regulations and standards that we are kind of a, a, we are marketing around the world and in Canada. We are working also with the SMR vendors that are coming up with very interesting concepts and they are asking for our um, capability or our ability to convert those uh, incipient designs into real life designs, into license uh, and license those designs and just uh, run with them in a project, uh, procure them and deliver them uh, at site. So um, we are trying to, to advertise those uh, opportunities that are out there. So for everyone, it's for the public to see, 
for the industry to see, for the potential investor to see. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a very wide, wide and bright, uh, bright, uh, uh, white public that we have, or audience that we have to, to, to cater f uh, for. So. Yeah. And what is the stage for small modular reactors in Canada right now? Well, I believe that right now um, the stage is much better defined than any other jurisdiction in the Western world. Wow. <laughs> um, the fact is that there is a process mm -hmm. by which the proponent, the reactor vendor proponents, could come to the uh, regulatory authority and uh, present their design and get their blessing, mm -hmm. which is much more uh, palatable to a small outfit because it will require less capital. Mm -hmm. So they have their concept reviewed by the regulator. And once the regulator puts the stamp of approval, they have more, um, I would say, authority to trumpet to the world that their design is feasible. And by doing that, they can attract capital, they can attract uh, people, and they can move forward the design. Right from having that authorization to going for a full a certification process is um, the other step that the regulator will um, kind of uh, be better prepared for because they went through the pre-licensing stage. Mm -hmm. So the regulator already would know their design much better than if they were to come totally anew. Right. So, they will have their pre-licensing, they will have their licensing, and then after the reactor design is licensed, they can start the construction of that reactor. So I, I, I just was saying that Canada is a pioneer on that because no other jurisdiction has this kind of a stage approach. Yeah. So in the States, um, the people or the companies have to have a ready design and go to the NRC and mm -hmm. ask for the official certification, which takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So um, by doing this stage approach, you can save in, in kind of a capital, you can save in kind of a risks. So that's why companies are flocking to the Canadian market and they are asking us, they are asking some of the utilities to for help in that pre-licensing process. So that's what I see that as in a very, very interesting opportunity, very, very exciting opportunity. Yeah, so have you seen a, a lot of designs come through then <clears throat> for the SMRs? I think that you are um, asking a very interesting question. I would say that we have seen some of them. Mm -hmm. I cannot say which ones of them because it's a kind of a very kind of a guarded. Yeah. Uh, information, but uh, we have seen some of them. Yeah, yes. and they look promising, or? Uh, I believe so, otherwise we wouldn't be engaged. Right, because so. this is a new area for SNC Lavalin, because you guys haven't worked with an SMR vendor before, correct? Actually, that statement is not truly, totally correct. We already have under our belt a number of months, or if not a year, a kind of a close collaboration with the SMR vendor community. Yeah, I'm excited to, whenever you guys make this more public, to hear more about <laughs> it, because I can see the excitement <laughs> on your face. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then, uh, okay, so let's say that, you know, you guys start working a lot with on SMR technology, where do you see, uh, I guess on a global scale, SMR is being useful as compared to can-do reactors being mm -hmm. useful? Yeah, um, S SMR is uh, very useful for the remote locations. Um, for the remote locations because um, that would save the, 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 the cost of building a kind of a very powerful um, nuclear station in that uh, location where that would require uh, mobilizing a large amount of people, large amount of resources, and delivering all these big components 
to that remote location. So having something that is a kind of a kind of a very portable, portable <laughs> uh, very kind of a easily kind of a handled, uh, that would be a big plus for those communities, remote communities. So let's say the north of Canada. In yeah, the north. extremely remote exactly. and cold. So, and cold. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be the, the beneficiary, the main beneficiary of this. Or a remote, a remote military base. Mm -hmm. um, mining where you have a isolated kind of a, a oil extraction a facility or complex that will require the grid to serve their needs and they can have any in-house kind of a power generator. So there you could drop a, an SMR. And it all depends on the, the kind of the, ty the type of uh, power and the magnitude of the power uh, that they will require. And then you have to properly size an SMR4. So this is the, fir the first beneficiary. The second beneficiary could be um, a utility that doesn't want to disburse a kind of a large amount of capital at mm -hmm. once. So they can start increasing their output, they will increase their revenue, and they could do that in a man manageable way. And they, that's how the utilities are pursuing that those uh, SMRs too. So uh, it, it's a very interesting because uh, technology because it has a lot of applications and, and that's why we are also interested in that and excited by it. Yeah. And so then tell me a little bit more about your role as vice president of the engineering department here. Is this sort of your job to determine how much time you guys invest in SMRs versus can do or? Well, not that much. I can determine how many engineers yeah. would work in a particular project and how many <laughs> engineers would work, in another, it would work in another particular project. So this is my main kind of a, a task and to have those engineers trained to have those engineers available for when the demand for them arises. Mm -hmm. So I, I am just look at me like a central bank of engineering. <laughs> so I just will have the, the money readily available for when it's required and I will just loan to the people so the economy could work. Yeah. So this is my, my role. Good, we need to facilitate That's future correct. growth in the industry. So do you guys uh, have a lot of student internships um, right now we have students, summer students, uh -huh. um, co-op students. Um, it's um, depending on the programs they are. Normally they come in ha into the house in February, they leave us by September, and we keep a rotation of students that way. Some of them are rehired at the end of their uh, terms uh, and they come and, and kind of work with us. Um, some of them we never see, but this is the, the kind of the dynamic of this, of this uh, kind of uh, engagement with the uh, students. Yeah, and since you've worked in nuclear and been an operator at a plant before in a different country, what are some of the similarities and differences you see in training the workforce you know, on a global scale? Well, in the global scale, I would say that the Western world is very blessed um, because of the standards of safety that uh, the regulators and the society demands. Yeah. Um, it's a blessing because this is an open society where everyone, anyone can make a request for information and that request cannot be easily denied. Mm. So in that regard, the utilities the designing organizations, um, everyone that is involved in this industry is striving to maintain their standards because the last thing that one could lose in this industry is the credibility and the, and the, the, the record, so the, the safety records. So that's why everyone, um, I see the, the benefit of this open and transparent society um, in, in serving the, 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 our industry. I, I would say this is a very positive uh, uh, development. I've worked in other societies where that transparency is not there, and I would say that those are more prone to 
kind of uh, pitfalls in the safety record area. So yeah, and going off of that, it's it's a hard question, but because you don't have as strict standards everywhere around the world, let's say another, and it's not to say that these accidents occurred because of not adhering to standards, but let's say another Fukushima or another Chernobyl happened within the next 10 years. How do you think we could bring up the industry again and keep the momentum of the industry going? Or if we should? Well, uh, I believe that we have to first internalize what the problem of this um, hypothetical <laughs> accident. Um, if it is uh, something that is um, solvable, so we um, are in the obliged to kind of uh, fix the problem and keep the industry running. Um, so far, we have a, a, a good record and the, the statistics prove that uh, accidents in nuclear plants do not happen very often. So we have uh, years, uh, years and years of uh, experience and uh, combined uh, operating experience. And they, it shows that they are very few on them. They are very loud though. When they happen, everyone knows about them. Right. And the, the, the impact is, um, is, is, is great in, in, in terms of the public uh, awareness. But uh, I believe that this industry has kept the, 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 the operational record very, very, very near to, 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 the le to, to standards that no other industry, with exception of the aerospace, um, uh, are, are there. I mean, so we are at the a par with them. So. so it sounds like we need some marketing. We need to show that to people. I believe that this is our weakness. Yeah. We are good engineers, but we are not good marketers. And do you think that in terms of preparing the next group to come in and take the industry forward, do we have to change engineering curriculums to you know, make students more aware of the newer technologies like the can-do and the SMR technologies? Or is that more just on the job learning? Actually, I do believe that um, it's a combination. Uh, I believe that we have to um, get the students um, thrilled enough so to know that there is a bright future out there and that there are new technologies. It's not the ones that are happening because these technologies that we are working on may be a passe in 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. So. And they are in charge of the technology that will happen 10 years from now. So this is the way I would frame their, 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 the question or the challenge to them. So this is what happens. This is keeping us excited. And we are counting on you to come and help us deliver in this one and also to develop something 10 years down the road that we never thought of. Yeah, that's so. A, that is yeah. our. That's amazing. So you are of the mindset of let's just continually innovate. Let's not stick to one design for the next 20 years. That's correct. Do you think that uh, is feasible financially, you know, in terms of going through all the licensing and the regulations and the testing? At some point in time, um, the industry will decide what is the best path for itself. Yeah. Um, currently, we have a number of designs out there um, that, in my opinion, will kind of uh, saturate the industry. Uh, those designs will have to go through the evolution cycle. And the ones that are more mature, perhaps they will be the ones surviving. Uh, the other ones that are not mature enough, they will kind of a drop of the race. So there will be some kind of a Darwinian process uh, taking mm -hmm. place. But that Darwinian process doesn't end, let's assume this decade. This decade, there would be a kind of a natural selection taking place. But the next decade, or so 20 years from now, there will be another evolution. And this is what happens, uh, what's happening with these plants. First, the first generation went up. Then the second generation went up. 
Now we're talking Gen 3 or Gen 3 plus generation. And we are working on other designs that no one's paying attention to mm -hmm. other than SMRs. Yeah. We have a generation four with a more kind of a robust fuel cycle, more safer, a kind of a fuel out there, accident tolerant and so on. And the industry hasn't done a proper work of divulging all these uh, kind of uh, achievements that we have. And uh, it's kind of a chugging along very quietly, but there is work in generation four already taking place. So perhaps the SMRs will have to compete with generation four. And who knows, generation five would be 20 years down the road, or the fusion will kind of start uh, showing more kind of a signs of promise and then the fusion perhaps will trumpet everything else. You have such an optimistic future for new technologies. Uh, I believe that um, the, 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 the way that um, humanity works is just moving towards the future, towards, pro towards progress, towards innovation. We never kind of uh, are happy with ourselves. We are just always reaching for the stars. So. Yeah. So then, okay, what about this scenario? So let's say, you know, people want to solve climate change really quickly. So they say, let's just stick to one reactor design and make a bunch of those reactors all over the world. No innovation, we just invest in one reactor type. And that would be perfect. The, that would be perfect, but very idealistic. Well, yeah. Because... Um, this is um, the way that um, humans work. One part of humanity thinks one way, the other part think different, and the other part. So I would expect if that were to happen, that hypothetical situation of yours were to happen, mm -hmm. two or three designs would take place at the same time. It's just to mimic what history tells us. Yeah. We have VWRs, we have PWRs, we have AHWRs. Right. <laughs> we never stuck to one. We never stuck to one. Yeah. And if you look at other industries, the same. Yeah. You have the Samsung, you have the Apple, you have the... So there is never one product because one product doesn't solve all the needs of the, 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 the different uh, kind of uh, type of people that are out there. So. Yeah, that's true. And I guess the different types of reactors also play into the different uses of nuclear. That's so in here at SNC Lavalin, kind of what are, what's your guys' focus on the use of nuclear? Um, well, we have um, uh, we have um, I would say, and is not trying to boast uh, or to market the stuff. We have one unique capability, and that we offer to the markets, uh, the, the the emerging markets. Uh, uh, the, the, the design that we, we, we have and we kind of uh, keep improving is such that the country doesn't need a robust manufacturing industry to manufacture, to build, and to operate. Um, and on top of that, the fuel doesn't need enrichment. Mm. So uh, we burn natural uranium. So you kind of eliminate the dependency of having to uh, buy enriched uranium with all the legal problems and kind of a logistics uh, problems of transportation, a storage, a kind of a, a safeguarding of this uh, enriched uranium. That so so basically we eliminate those uh, kind of uh, barriers, but by offering a natural uranium type of uh, fuel. And uh, in addition to that, we can easily create isotopes. So we don't need to go and have another research, rea research reactor, just kind of a harv a harvesting isotopes. So you can just uh, have an operating reactor and you just pull targets and just uh, kind of extract the isotopes uh, like uh, it's a normal ongoing situation. So these are the three main benefits that we, I see from this uh, particular type of reactors. I don't say that uh, this is the only 
uh, reactors that can solve all the world's needs, but this is the benefit and the, 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 the areas where we are kind of focusing on. So recently we have uh, helped uh, one of the utilities to kind of uh, uh, deliver some kind of uh, a ways to create isotopes. So it's, it's very exciting. So that, that's where we, we kind of uh, keep ourselves busy. Yeah, and so sort of where is SNC going in the next 10 years? How are you guys improving, diversifying mm -hmm. your work portfolio? Well, um, that is a very interesting question. Uh, I think that uh, we have um, right now to balance the financial a kind of a possibilities of ours with what we uh, do out there. So it's like uh, we have to have a strong revenue uh, source to kind of uh, pour into the R&D kind of a side of the equation. Mm -hmm. So right now, our focus is to improve the current design that we have. Our focus is to um, help the SMR community around um, and just to uh, deliver engineering services as uh, to the best we can. So, and with those uh, revenue streams, we will we are deciding how to apportion them to new products and to uh, training people and doing something else. So, that that is our kind of a model right now. We are a, a publicly traded company. Mm. So we also all, we have a fiduciary duty to our shareholders. So, and we have to work in tandem with them to uh, kind of a deliver, um, deliver kind of a wealth to them too. Yeah. And as we wrap up here, where do you see yourself going in, in the next few years in this industry? And what kind of mark do you hope to leave on the industry? Well, I, well, uh, I have my kind of a legacy wish, I would say. Yeah. Um, I just want the, to leave behind people that are capable of just kind of a caring from what I left the, the, the company to them. Uh, this is what is going to be, uh, it's going to make me feel realized. And uh, what the future brings to, uh, to me uh, uh, in particular, I don't know, I'm still young, so perhaps I will be, I don't know, at a work site or at another customer location. Who knows? I mean, I've been in several countries already, so I yeah. don't mind being in another one. So it, it depends. Going to keep traveling yeah, and spreading the knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Any countries that are at like the top of your list that you'd want to go work in the nuclear industry for? I could um, be open to entertain any uh, opportunities in different countries, in different uh, parts of SNC. Um, I, I think that, um, as I was saying, my legacy is to kind of uh, um, spread what I've learned, um, kind of uh, see the, the results of what I'm designing. Um, this is, uh, to me, these are the two main uh, areas where I just would feel realized. I see a design that I worked on built and operating, and I see people that I work with, and I just brought them up and just stepping into my positions or even going higher than my position that I will feel that I did my job. Yeah, great, Ruben, thank you so much. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <to you. laughs>